a crow in the house. The young crow had fallen from its nest and was fluttering about on the road, in danger of being crushed by a cart or a tonga or seized by a cat. When I picked it up and brought it home, it was in a very sorry condition, beak gaping and head dropping, and we did not expect it to live. But grandfather and I did our best to bring it round. We fed it by pricing its beak gently open with a pencil, pushing in a little bread and milk, and then removing the pencil to allow it to swallow. We varied this diet with occasional doses of grandmother's homemade plump wine. And as a result, the young crow was soon on the road to recovery. He was offered his freedom, but he did not take it. Instead, he made himself at home in the house. Grandmother, Aunt Mabel and even some of grandfather's pets objected. But there was no way of getting rid of the bird. He took over the administration of the house. We were not sure that he was male, but he was called Caesar. Be before long, Caesar was joining us at mealtimes. Besides finding his own crubs or beetles in the garden, he danced about on the dining table and gave us no peace until he had been given his small bowl of meat and soup and vegetables. He was always restless, fidgeting about, investigating things. He would hop across a table to empty a matchbox of its content or rip the daily paper to shreds or overturn a vase of flowers or tug at the tail of one of the dogs. That crow will be the ruin of us grumbled grandmother, picking marigolds off the carpet. Can't you keep him in a cage? We did try keeping Caesar in cage, but he was so angry and objected with such fierce cowing and flapping that it was better for our nerves and peace of mind to give him the run of the house. He did not show any inclination to join the other crows in the banyan tree. Grandfather said this was because he was really a jungle crow, a raven of sorts and probably felt a little contemptuous of very ordinary carrion crows. But it seemed to me that Caesar, having grown used to living with humans on equal terms, had become snobbish and did not wish to mix with his own kind. He would even squabble with Harold the hornbill. Perching on top of, the, of Harold's cage, he would peck at the big bird's feet, whereon Harold would swear, swear and scold and try to catch Caesar through the bars. In time, Caesar learned to talk a little, as ravens sometimes do, in a cracked, throaty voice. He would sit for hours outside the window, banging on the glass with his beak and calling, Hello! Hello! He seemed to recognize the click of the gate when I came home from school and would come to the door with a hop, skip and jump, saying, Hello! Hello! I had also taught him to sit on my arm and say, Kiss! Kiss! while he placed his head gently against my mouth. On one of Aunt Mabel's visit, Caesar alighted on her arm and cackled, Kiss! Kiss! Aunt Mabel was delighted and possibly flattered and leaned forward for a kiss. But Caesar's attention shifted to my aunt's gleaming spectacles and thrusting at them with his beak, he knocked them off. Aunt Mabel never was a success with the pets. Pet or pest? Grandmother insisted that Caesar was a pest in spite of his engaging habits. If he had restricted his activities to our own house, 
it would not have been so bad but he took to visiting neighboring houses and stealing pens and pencils hair ribbons combs keys shuttlecocks toothbrushes and false teeth he was especially fond of toothbrushes and made a collection of them on top of the cupboard in my room most of the neighbors were represented in our house by a toothbrush toothbrush sales went up that year so did grandmother's blood pressure caesar spied on children going into the banyas shop and often managed to snatch sweets from them as they came out clothes pegs fascinated him neighbors would return from the bazaar to find their washing lying in the mud and no sign of the pegs these two found their way to the top of my cupboard it was caesar's gardening activities that finally led to a disaster he was helping himself to our neighbor's beans when a stick was flung at him breaking his leg i carried the unfortunate bird home and grandfather and i washed and bandaged his leg as best as we could but it would not mend caesar hung his head and no longer talked he grew weaker day by day refusing to eat an occasional sip of grandmother's homemade wine was all that kept him going one morning i found him dead on the sofa his legs stiff in the air poor caesar his anti social habits had led to his early end i dug a shallow grave in the garden and buried him there along with all the toothbrushes and clothes pegs he had taken so much trouble to collect